God bless everybody. Thank you for tuning in for another episode of the I Game, the Illegitimate Game. This is Brother Derek. Still here to talk about faith, family. Still here serving God, talking about the Lord. And today, I have a special guest, good friend of mine, Brother Paul. He's a husband, father, speaker, mentor, evangelist, minister, master barber, owns his own barbershop. And today, we're going to talk about entrepreneurship, evangelism, restoration, which is his ministry. And we're just going to let God have his way because my brother has a story to tell. And God is always in control, no matter how far up or down, left or right you go. And God bless you, Brother Paul. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. I, I'm, I'm so happy and blessed yeah. just to be here. I appreciate you know, it. Just be here is awesome. Yeah, man. We finally got a chance to talk. You know, it's God's timing. We, oh, yes. You know, I asked you about it, I think, maybe two months ago. Yes, yes. And, you know, I think today is the right day. I think so, too. You know, perfect timing. Yeah. Everything is in God's timing. So, you know, I'm looking to have fun and just share. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so God is good. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. um let's we talked last night, you know, we talk off and on. Yes. But um I I learned a few things about you last night that I think are really, really interesting and it could bless a lot of men. Yes. But um just uh just for the audience, you know, tell everybody a little bit of your background, your bio a little bit. Well, um I was born and raised in a little town called Cumberland County. Cumberland. Probably about an hour, twenty minutes, hour and thirty minutes from here. Yeah. You know, born in the country. And um, big family, no brothers or sisters, no siblings, but uncles, aunts, you know, a lot of cousins. A lot of cousins. And we all, you know, we have done manual work throughout our lives. You know, some of the things, a lot of people probably that's listening probably won't know what I'm talking about. But pokewood, tobacco, you know, um, bailing hay, anything manual, we did it, you know. So Wow. Yeah, yeah. So you know what it's like to get up at 5 in the morning. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I did my manual work when I was younger. Yeah. As I got older, I tried to kind of transition from that, you know. But, yeah, yeah, family, yeah. hard workers, yeah. Yeah, because my dad, he grew up in Louisiana, and they used to pick pecans, watermelons. Oh, yeah, yeah. Cut the head off chickens. He was doing that when he was young. <laughs> we did it all, man. We did it all, you know. But I'm thankful for that because it taught me the importance of hard work. You know, that if you want it, you got to go get it. You got to get up early, you know, get up before everybody else. Get out there, make the money, and do what you got to do to survive. What age? So was it was it like an agriculture farm or an animal farm? Like, which one was it? Um, basically, it was just, um, like, for an example, I talked about um, pokewood. Yeah. Pokewood, basically, you go out there, cut down trees, cut them up into logs, okay. eight-foot logs, put them on the truck take them to a place called a wood yard and they would take it, put it on a waiting scale, yeah. the truck, get the money, go back out, get another load. And we did this in the hot summertime, like a hundred plus degrees out there. Okay. Now I'm I'm a, I'm gonna keep it real. I wasn't like some of my cousins that really did it. I mean they did it like constantly. I did it here and there. Okay. So you know, but I knew the meaning of it, you know, from from what it was. Yeah, you said I, tobacco too. Tobacco, bailing hay, um, tobacco, um, hanging tobacco in a tobacco field, in a tobacco barn, you know, and just, you know, a lot of manual work. Yeah, okay. a lot of manual work. So it wasn't a lot of animals then? Not a lot. Okay, no. so you didn't have to milk no, cows? They, and... they, no, 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 no. I ain't doing it more. So, okay, so it was more agriculture yep. type stuff. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, you made a little bit of money then, right? No. <laughs> oh, really? No. You made a few dollars here and there, you wow. know. Because I was young. I was a kid, okay. you know what I mean? So my family took care of it as a way of chipping in and, you know, helping out. Oh, so your parents got all the money? Yeah. Basically. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right. So, yeah. the, so the family won. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. You know, made a few dollars or something, you know, for, <laughs> for a young teenager to make some money and get some clothes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, when you chip it in, then they feed you that night, you feel like a superhero. Oh, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, because yeah. my dad, he did a little bit of both. Oh, okay. The cows, the chickens, the um, watermelons, you said the pecan trees? Yeah. So he did a little bit of animals and the agriculture. Gotcha, gotcha. Yes, yeah, sir. So it's, yeah. um, because my grandfather had a little farm on top of a hill somewhere. Oh, wow. It was an area called um, Carfax. Mm. Yeah, the bigger city was like Pineville, Louisiana. Gotcha, gotcha. wow. So yeah, he told me some of them stories. Oh, okay, wow. Yeah, it's, now if I tell you this one real quick, they used to have to walk behind the pickup truck and bend down, pick up the watermelons. Mm -hmm. Throw them in the back of the pickup truck while it was rolling. 
Oh, wow. So imagine doing that eight hours a day. Yeah. Very strenuous. Yeah. Bending. Yeah, I still remember the day my dad picked me up off my feet one day, like, I decided, to, <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. I, I grew up too fast. <laughs> yeah. I said something about sitting his head. Mm. He went. Wow. And that's when I was like, okay. Picking up all the watermelons going on the farm. And make, yeah. You're just strong for no strong. reason. Strong, yes. Poe was the same thing. Strong. Yeah. So yes. you, everybody in your family. 12 years old, got looked like you've been lifting weights. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's ready for football. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. They were. My cousins were. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. So when did you make the transition from the um, rural life to, like, the city life? Like, around high school? Um, No, not high school. It was back in 2006. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, not to go too far back too fast, but, you know, um, my family and I, we lived in the country, of course. And after, you know, I did construction for a while, you know, as I got older in my 20s, yeah. some things I did, you know, out there, you know, in the world that, you know what I'm saying, wasn't proud of. But, you know, back then, that's what you did back in the 90s and, and, and during that time period. But, you know, I was doing construction back in 2006 yeah. and um, hated it. I used to go to bed at night literally having dreams of me falling off of a scaffold. And remember that when I was young, at the age of 12, that I had a talent and a gift for cutting hair. Yes. I remember picking up my first pair of clippers, my, my dad's clippers, went in the bathroom and just cut my hair, took the clippers, didn't even have a pair of liners, adjusted them, did an edge up. Left, everybody was like, man, who cut your hair? What barbershop you went to? I was like, I did it. It was like, what? Give me a cut. Then from there, started cutting everybody in the neighborhood, all of my cousins, all of my friends. And so ended up, you know, never took it seriously. Yeah. Some people, I didn't even charge. I just did it just for a hobby, you know, and um, because I was doing other things to make money, yeah. you know. So ended up, you know, I did that for some years off and on. But um, the construction job was the thing that, you know, I went through a time period where, you know, I needed extra money, you know, wasn't any money coming in. I wanted to do it the right way. Yeah. So I started, you know, working at a construction site, building, not building houses, but restoration of houses. Okay. We would take old bricks, restore it with new bricks. And I was in charge of making the mortar and building the scaffolds. So I would literally had to build scaffolds I can't remember. I mean, way up in the air. And them things are shaking. And, you know, I'm sitting there petrified, afraid of, afraid of heights, you know, going to bed at night, dreaming that I'm falling. I was like, I can't do this no more. Wow. And God brought to my remembrance. Remember, you used to cut hair. Wow, so I was like, man, I went to one of the deacons in the church that I was in. Yeah. And that's a back a little bit further. I'm going to share with you my testimony, how I got to that point. Okay. But I told him, I was like, you know, I'm thinking about going to barber school cut hair you know i'm doing this construction job job i don't like it i hate it he was like let me contact the owner of a barbershop which was called agape a christian barbershop owned by a christian man of god he was like i'm gonna contact him i'm gonna introduce you to him gave me his number i called him set up a meeting went talk with him sat there still had my construction clothes on <laughs> you know he used to talk he, he teased me about it all the time yeah. he said man you came in with a dirty t-shirt on and some boots man from the country it was like I saw God in you, and He said, "I'm gonna give you a ch I'm gonna give you an opportunity. I'm gonna put you in school." His name was Mr. Mac, Mr. Yes. McGeorge. I'm gonna put you in barber school. I'm gonna help you get your license. I'm gonna allow you to cut hair, teach you. The barbers here are gonna work with you. Then within a year and a half, you'll be a certified barber. Now, now this is the thing that was so crazy. During that time, I got laid off from the construction job. Yeah. So during three months of, of layoff, I didn't have any money. So when I met with the owner of the barbershop and he gave me the opportunity, the day that I agreed to leave the country, which I'm comfortable work being at, mm -hmm. being in a country around people you know, and this is going to sound kind of strange, but back then our parents told us, don't go to the city. People get shot down there all the time. You know, it had a bad stigma to it. Yeah. But I was like, man, you know, I'm going, I'm going to do something different. I got to get away from, from the country and make some money. And, and you know, and do something different. Yeah. So Kane gave me an opportunity. The day that he hired me, I was laid off from the construction job. I went and got my barber spark and a few um, items that I need, a few tools. The owner of the construction company called me like, we're going back to work Monday. I'm going to pick you up. You can be ready. 
So I had to make a decision. Do I go to a city that I'm unfamiliar with in a territory that I don't know anything about working around men that's very skilled, been cutting hair for 20 plus years in a big city and me being this country guy coming to the city and have to learn. So I said, do I do that, step out on faith, yeah. or do I go back to something that I hate that I don't want to do? But you're familiar with it. That I'm familiar with. Yeah. I said, I told him, I said, I'm sorry, I'm not coming back. I'm going to become a barber. And I'm thinking that he's going to be like, man, you know, stay. He was like, I wish you the best. He hung up. The rest is history. <laughs> God, I'm telling you, God really worked. Yeah, awesome, man. Yeah, it's funny how those moments happen, because whenever you got to make that choice, there's always something to pull you back. Oh, yes. It's a leap of faith. It's always that. Yeah, moment. you got to, anything in life, if you don't step out on faith, you'll never receive what God has for your future. You know, it's yeah. easy to be in your comfortable state, but to step out is hard because you don't know. People are so afraid of failure, but failure is not a bad thing. No. Giving up is a bad thing. When you give up, you fail. You don't fail because <laughs> you learn from each opportunity. Yeah. Each setback is a comeback. It's just so ill you got that one phone call. Because, oh, see, yeah. if he didn't call, you didn't have a choice. Yes. But when you make that choice, there's just something about that moment. Yes. Because you have that point of reference. I got this call. I made that choice. But sometimes when you don't have a choice at all and you just got pushed, I think there's, I want, I'm trying to think of the right way to say it. Sometimes I feel like there's just a little bit more power or pride to it. Right. Because I made a choice. Yes. And stepped out on faith. Yes. So God's still with you. Yes. But you had a choice. So. And that's the thing. God literally led me there. Like it, it reminds me of Abraham when he told him, said, it's, get out from your kindreds yeah. and from among your people, your comfortability, yeah. and go to a land that I will show thee. I, I just stepped out on faith. Yeah. And I, I felt myself being led by God. <laughs> you know, and once, once he did, I trusted him because yeah. I knew he knew what, yeah. what was best for me. How long was that phone call? When I spoke, a few minutes. Literally, I knew. Okay. Yeah, I knew right then and there. I didn't either, even hesitate. I was told, I look, I'm gone. Okay. I'm not coming back. You know, I'm going to step out okay. and I'm, I'm going to become a barber. All right. You ain't had that yeah. five minutes. I'm going to call you back. No, None it was that. instant. Okay. Yeah, I knew this was what I wanted to do. Did it help that you already been cutting hair? Did that already? It did. It. I knew that I had a gift, mm -hmm. but I had to sharpen my gift and had to build a skill. Because okay. barbering is a skill. You have to, you know what I'm saying? You got to learn a lot of the, not just cutting hair, but there's a lot of theory that you have to learn. Okay. Nursing, the theory part of barbering and nursing is almost identical. You got to learn every part of the body. You have to learn all the different chemicals, what to use, what you can't use. Yeah. You got to know how to um, population control where um, disease is not, how not to spread diseases among different clients. I mean, it's a lot, but, you know, I, I put my mind to it and I did it and went through it. You know, and one of the good things, I do apprenticeship, I give back. Okay. So I help other guys and help other people get their um, barber's license. Yeah, where was, you said Agape, right? Yep, the shop that I was at was called Agape Barbershop. And what part of Richmond was that in? Southside, right Southside. in the Southside Plaza. Okay, okay. Yep, okay. Christian Barbershop, sold out for Christ. Yeah, awesome. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Um, is it next to that Jamaican spot? It's right Right beside the beauty supply. The beauty supply. Yeah. And Mr. Mack, if you're li listening, I want to say thank you for that opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Shout out Mr. Mack. Yes, sir. Yeah. It's um, God put people there. Oh, yes. I always call God the ultimate chess player. Oh, yes. Yes. Just setting stuff up, waiting for you to wake up to it. Oh, yes. Because you were cutting hair at 12, so yes. you already had a little bit of inspiration. I had it. I, I knew I was good. I just, you know, I was good as a talent. Mm -hmm. I just had to build my skill, become Good, good, real, really good. Well, let me ask you this. Um, you ain't never thought about cutting hair in Cumberland? No, because it's only one barbershop. That was actually was two. Mm -hmm. One gentleman had a barbershop at his house. Yeah. In the other shop, there was one barber that literally cut everyone, and he didn't really give any opportunities. Okay. You know? So you were like, I, I do my own thing. I don't teach. I don't, right. I don't need anybody. So you, yeah, you weren't going to grow out there. Nah, I had to come to the city. Yeah. God will make you grow. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, what age was this? Um, 28. 28, okay. Uh-huh, 28. So you was already married at this time? Um, yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. All yep. right. Well, that's, um, matter of fact, 
can you share that testimony about the heart? So yes, yeah, because that led up to your salvation, right? It did. It really okay. Did. Yeah, let's let's talk about that. Okay. Yep. I share this quite often. Yeah. Some of y'all might hear this again. Be like, I heard that testimony, but yeah, because yeah, because yeah, I want people to hear about yeah, the healing. You know, that's my testimony, yeah, and it's a powerful yeah. testimony that God has given yeah, me. So, ladies and gentlemen, God can and will heal. Yes. Pray, pray for His will, and brother, yeah. how'd, that, how'd that go? So basically, when I was young. Um, I was raised in church. My yeah. mother, my parents, Southern Baptist, you know, um, love God. You know, we went traditionally. And I can remember at the age of seven or eight that in the country, when they would have revivals at night and they would have the doors open and the windows up. And it, mostly everyone would set, the church would be packed, but everyone would set out in their cars. And they would roll that window down. You can hear the preaching and the singing in the choirs right through the through the door in the, in the window. So I remember, I can literally remember as a kid with my, with my suit on, getting out the car by myself, walking in the church and sitting there and listening to the preacher preach. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so my parents, they used to talk about that also. So fast forward. Um, I remember at the age of 17, you know, back then too, we had this thing where, um, you know, at a certain age, when you turn 12, you know, you got to, you know, they want you to give your life to Christ. Yeah. And we had this thing what we called the mourner's bench. Some of y'all may have heard of it. So basically, when that time comes, you will go before the pastor and say, I want to give my life to Christ. So they will set you on this front pew and they will give you, give you 30 days to think about your wrong and to repent. So you would leave, of course. You know, you can't do no wrong for 30 days. After the 30 days, you will come back. And then while you're there, um, the pastor will say, do you have your religion? Now, none of this is in the Bible. I hope nobody <laughs> get upset about it, but it's not written. So do you have your religion? So everybody would stand up before the church. So I got my religion. Yeah. So the thing about it was, once you get your religion, God's supposed to give you a word. And nobody you can tell this word to. It's only for you to know. They, they don't even sound scriptural. So wow, that... Okay, yeah, yeah, go, yeah. No, nah, you got you it. Sure? Okay. You got it. So, I, anyway, I, I don't want to take the conversation left. I got you. Because I see good and bad in that. Right. But I don't want to take the conversation left. Right, right. So ahead. anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was good because it, it, I'm not speaking against it, but yeah. it just was a trans, you know, getting me to where God yeah. wanted me to be. Yeah. So ended up, I did that. Because you know, we can talk about that for four hours. <laughs> but go ahead, go yep. ahead. <laughs> so ended up, I did that, you yeah. know, when you yeah. got on the morning's bench, yeah. got up, didn't have no word. Everybody was telling me, I got my religion, got yours. I was like, yeah. And I didn't know what in the world we was talking about. Amen. So then after you, you you did that, they would set a date for everybody to get baptized. So they were baptized, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So basically saying, I therefore baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost, taking the water, bring you out, boom. I got baptized. Went right back doing the same thing. I couldn't wait. My cousins, a lot of us couldn't wait to go back and do our thing. You know what I'm saying? So we went back doing the same thing. Yeah. Then at the age of 17, um, I can remember me and my cousins, two of my cousins, one of them passed. We was hanging out. We were smoking marijuana. We was drinking. You know, and to be transparent, my testimony is I come through a long line where my families are. My family is on my mom's side and you know my dad was too alcoholics love to drink love to party you know just something they love to do yes, so i was i can remember me and my cousins at the age of 15 16 drinking you know you know just finding someone randomly that's old enough to go to the store and buy us wine buy us beer so we'll drink we'll do all these things you know so at the age of 17 i can remember me and my cousins, we was drinking. We had been smoking weed all day. So I remember I couldn't get high, no matter what I tried. I, I just, you know, the weed wasn't getting me high. And I can remember waking up that Sunday morning, just not feeling right. Like feeling like, like something, you know, my heart skipping beats. Like it would beat, then it would slow down, then it would stop, then it would beat. I was like, what's going on? So I can remember riding in the back of the car with my cousins. And it was like, you know, had the music playing. Yeah. All at once, I tapped them. I was like, something ain't right with my heart. It was like, what's wrong? I was like, something ain't right. So they rushed me home, you know, and ended up my mom and dad, they came and checked me out. They, you know, they had, to, they left. And so my dad was like, 
we're going to take you to the hospital and get you checked out. So during this time, it's getting so bad that I'm hyperventilating and sweating and can't breathe. He rushed me to the hospital, Farmville Hospital. Go in, they check my heart. They said, we think it's the drugs in your system. You know, that the marijuana. Okay. You need to go home, let it wear off, and you'll be fine. Before I can get back home, which was like a 30-minute drive, it, my, the, it gets so bad when my heart condition, when my heart started beating and skipping beats, and, and I'm talking about to the point I thought I was going to die. Grab my chest, scream. My daddy rushed me right to the hospital. Make a long story short, they ended up keeping me in the hospital. And they couldn't find out what was going on, but they could see the condition of my heart. They, they took me to a specialist, the MCV. Put me in the hospital like for a week or two. I can't remember how long. A few weeks or so. Yeah. And they done a test. They said, you got a heart murmur, a hole in your heart which is a wow. leaky valve. Wow. This is something I, I must have had from a child and didn't know it. Mm -hmm. So to the point where they it got so bad, they can literally see the blood like in my heart, not coming through the, through the position of the, of the valves where it's supposed to be. So the doctor's like, no, we're going to come up with a plan to help your heart condition. You know, we'll, 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 get, we'll reconvene and, and we'll sit with you and see. Time went on. They tried everything. They tried I mean, medication, everything, nothing is working. My aunt, which was a lady that had been delivered from alcohol, alcoholism and depression. She was the one that brought me to the church, the same church I got saved at mm -hmm. when I was young. So anyway, tried everything. I was losing weight. Um, they tried to feed me, ensure anything you could think of to help my heart condition. Nothing is working. I couldn't even walk but a short distance, like a few feet without being out of breath. And, you know, I thought I was going to die. So she said, why don't you come with me to church? She said, God can heal you. So I'm thinking, I was like, well, I've tried everything. The doctors can't, ain't help me. I'm going to go with you just for prayer. See what happens. Yeah. Went with her that Sunday. So weak, I couldn't even walk through the doors of the church. I had to be helped in the church. Pastor prayed, made altar call, made my way up to the front of the church, out of breath. He prayed for me. He said, son, the Lord want to save you. You ever been baptized in Jesus' name? I said, no. He said, you need to do it. He said, you need to give your life to the Lord today. I made my mind up. I said, okay. Went, got dressed. Walked down in his baptism pool. And I, re I can remember the pastor saying these words. Yeah. I therefore baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I went down in the water, came out straightway out of the water and healed instantly from my heart condition. Literally healed, felt brand new, felt so good, literally walked home three miles. From the church, walked to my aunt's house and my grandmother that's passed on, saw me walking up the driveway and people are looking, how in the world is he walking? He was sick, went to church sick, came back healed. God totally healed me, went back to the doctors, they did their x-rays, they ran their tests, checked everything. They said, we can't find that hole in your heart. Send me home. And from the age of 17, bless God and Lord's will, I'll be 50 this Tuesday, yeah. February 6th, never had that heart condition again. He's a healer. Yep. He's a healer. Yep. Never had that heart condition. So that's the first yeah. part of my testimony, how God yeah. healed me. But see, God was setting me up because he had put me in a place where he was preparing me to be saved, to become a ministry, yeah. and to ministry and to be, you know, to do what I'm doing this day, yeah. you know. So everyone in that. Yeah, so everyone in your family knew Jesus did that. Yes, everyone. So he was did. a testimony for the whole family. Yep, they not only heard it, they saw the testimony. Yeah, how did it affect them? A lot of people, they was like, "Wow," you know. But at that time, they weren't really thinking that deep, you know. They just know, you know, he's better. He's doing good. So that's yeah. awesome. Now, one thing my aunt told me, she said, "Whatever you do, don't go back out in the world. Don't go back drinking. Whatever you're doing." Leave your old friends alone. Stay in the church. Get filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Don't leave. Don't go back. So I did good for a minute. <laughs> Don't you know what happened? All my old buddies and my old friends. Yeah. Hey, my nickname was Pee Wee. Everybody know me by then. Come, hey, Pee Wee, come to the house. Cut my hair. You know, I need a haircut. Get me fresh. 
And during that time, I had stopped because I was so sick. So I said, well, ain't nothing but a haircut. Ended up going, cutting hair, backslid, ended up back out in the world. And this time, it's worse than, than what it was before. Because mm -hmm. from the age of 17 to the age of 28, the enemy had me out there doing things that I should have been dead or in prison for. Now, I didn't kill nobody, but I'm just saying living a lifestyle of sin and, and, and disobeying the laws of the land yeah. where I, I should have been dead or in prison, you know, just doing stuff that it wasn't even in my nature, you know, trying to impress people, wanting to fit in, you know, and all that time God was still pulling on my heart. So in the year of 2002, I ended up seeing my father get killed in a plane crash. That's how I gave my life to, to Christ. And I'm going to keep it, I'm going to be transparent. The enemy had me out there dealing drugs and everything. Mm -hmm. Just to be honest, you know. The devil's still in Cumberland? Yep, still in Cumberland County. Yeah. You know, making money, doing all this and that and the other. You know, running from the police, doing just stupid stuff. But God still had his protection over my life. Yeah. So, ended up, I remember going to bed at night. Seeing my father on that Tuesday. And um, talking to him, I was cutting his hair. Now, I come from a mixed background. My dad was white, my mom was black. Mm -hmm. My dad was a military man. You know, he was a um, Navy. You know, he was a merchant seaman. He did all that, you know, and he took care of me and my mom. He would go out, stay six months, come back, buy a house, buy, buy you know, everything we needed. Always sent us money, you know, very great provider, yeah. you know, but he stayed gone a lot. And my mother, you know, she had her own struggles. We all did. And so ended up, you know, um, had the heart condition. Then from that, when I seen my father got killed, and this is the part I wanted to say. Yes, sir. Um, I went to visit my dad and talk with him, cut his hair. He said, I want you to come. He was a, a, a private plane pilot. He owned his own private plane. He'd been flying during the time he was retired. So I went to visit him, cut his hair. He said, I want you to come back Thursday. I said, okay, I'll come back. At this time, out here doing all this crazy stuff. You know, police probably looking for me and everything else. Just couldn't find me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, he was wilding. Wilding. So in the country. Yeah. So went home that night, had a dream that Wednesday night that I was dead in a casket. I literally saw myself in this casket, woke up with such great fear, like what in the world is going on? Got up, went to see my dad and followed him to the airport. And during this time, I'm feeling like something ain't right. Something as bad is going to happen, but I'm thinking it's going to happen to me. See, my dad got in the airplane. He went on the went on the on the on the um on the strip. The runway. Runway. Yeah. I remember he went down once, came back, taxiing. Went down the second time, came back. The third time I see him pull a lever, the level, and went up. And as he's going up about 250 feet in the air, he's going towards this electric pole. And he tried to overcorrect it. About 250 feet and lost control. And I remember seeing them crash behind the airport, behind this area that was a, a chain fence. I couldn't get to him. When he crashed, I'm not even in Christ. I fell on my knees. The first thing I said was, Lord Jesus. I ran, tried to get to my father, couldn't get to him. Dial 911, couldn't get an answer. Jumped in the car, ran near the nearest house by the airport, told him to dial 911. My father just crashed his plane. Channel 12 News, helicopters, ambulances, all of them came. They had to end up, the fire department caught, cut a right away to get to my father, put him in the heli helicopter and mid flighting him to MCV. I jumped in the car, it took me two hours to get there. Yeah. Got to MCV, I'm thinking he's still alive. The doctors and the clergyman, as soon as I got there, called me into this little room, set me at this desk, said, I'm so, so sorry to tell you that you lost your father. Man, that thing broke me down. And I was like, I can't believe he's gone. I went home that night, and I'm telling you, so hurt, literally crying in my sleep, moaning and weeping. And as I'm crying and weeping in great sorrow, the Lord Jesus Christ in my subconscious appeared to me. And these are words that he told me. He said, son, if you don't come back to me now, you would never make it back. Man, when I woke up, and I tell you, man, I felt the love of God, but I felt the urgency to get back to Christ. Man, I got up. I didn't know what I was going to do. Now, the same 
pastor that baptized me at the age of 17 mm -hmm. through my aunt, because she was a member of that church, yeah. said, she said, why don't you get him to preach your father's eulogy? He preached my father's eulogy. He says, you need to get back into Christ. I said, I know. I said, I want to come back. I don't know how. I said, I'm out here doing this stuff. He said, just come as you are. I came back to church, rededicated my life to the Lord. God filled me within two weeks with the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. Took a man that should have been dead or in prison within the first year and a half. God put me into the ministry. Went out through the country preaching the gospel everywhere. So that's just a portion of what God did through my life right yeah. now. When you were traveling, what church were you with then? The same one you got baptized in? The same one. It was an apostolic church. It was called Apostolic Holiness Church. And that's how in Cumberland too? In Cumberland County. Okay. Yep. Yep. Straight. You know, baptism in Jesus' name, Holy Ghost, you know, filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. And how old were you at this time? You said 31? I was um, 28. 28? Yeah, okay. 28. Okay. 20, turning 29. Okay. Well, what age did you get married? Oh, man. This is before the plane crash? Yeah. Well, I went through, you know, I was married before then previous. Okay. And um, then, you know, the Lord blessed and uh, I got remarried again later. Okay. Yeah. What age was that? Oh, man. I got remarried and the age 35. 35. Yeah, something like that. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so that was after you was already yeah. preaching. Yeah, I was already Okay, yeah, because I was going to ask you, how did the transition from the streets to the plane crash to the ministry, I was going to ask you, how did that affect your family? Because they saw you transform. Yeah, they saw me transform too. You know, I got an older son, man. Him and I, like, best friends. He's okay. um, in his 30s now and... I literally just cut his hair, so yeah. you know we super close. You know, um, his mom passed away a few years back, so I that. and yeah, yeah, we all had you know good relationships. Everything was mended, you know. So even from that, you know, my I have a daughter. Um, you know, she's not my biological daughter, but she is my my daughter. If that makes sense, because yeah. I raised her. You yes. know, we super close. So you know, just during that time. When I, you know, I was still trying to find my way, yeah. you know, because I went through stuff. I'm going to say this just to keep it, keep it real. I thought when you get saved that everybody in the church is angels. Nobody sinned. I didn't know that everybody got something to work on. So things that I went Man. through, you know, Man. was yeah. pretty difficult, yeah. pretty challenging. But God allowed me to yeah. go through what I went through because it took me from the country through there right to the city. And that's when God really began to work in my life. Yeah, cause my mentor, when we used to sit through the, um, he's the one that taught me Hebrew and helped me understand the Bible when I, okay. when I was 28. Cause my, my real awakening when I was 28, but he used to tell us all the time, the church is a hospital. It is, yeah. And we all coming because we're sick of something. Right. We all have something we were dealing with. Oh yes. And either we went through it in the past or you dealing with it now. Oh yes. So we're supposed to share our sicknesses to help people. Yes. So if I got healed yesterday, I can help help you get healed today. Exactly. But if everybody's putting on this front that you're like not everything's sick, everything's perfect. Yeah. Now you you don't get any healing. You're preventing somebody else from being healed because you're not being real. So yeah. you said if you come through it and admit it's a hospital, and everybody admits they're sick or they were sick, then you can help people. See the thing about, and you're correct, 100. percent But the thing about the admitting part. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people are living a lifestyle that doesn't line up with the word. So they're still sick. So they're they're still, <laughs> they're, still they're willfully sick. sinning. And then lying. About and that's it. one thing I love about God. When yeah. God saved me yeah. and the way I got saved through what I've been through, being healed, seeing my father, this and that, being called. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? God literally speaking to me, yeah. saying, if you don't come back to me now, you'll never make it. All these yeah, things. Yeah, I want to talk about that too. Yeah. I'm telling you, you know what it did? It gave me a respect. And one okay. thing I told God, I would never be a type of minister that would be in the pulpit and preach one thing and live another. I can do it. Man, I don't understand man. how pastors and preachers, you know, oh, we all make mistakes. Now, willfully sinning, yes, yeah. we're imperfect. And I had to learn that. I'm going to make mistakes. Yeah. But one thing I refuse to do is, is to tell you, you got to live a lifestyle unto, unto Christ. And then I'm doing the opposite of what I'm telling you to do. Yeah. Paul said, he nice. that preached the gospel first must live it. You know, I said, before I be a hypocrite, mm. I'll shut the Bible Shut down and mm -hmm. shut up. And that's when the enemy knew it, too. That's why he, when he knocked me down, he made me stay down yeah. for a little while. It, yeah. And then, what's the other script? You held, you held to a higher standard. Oh, yeah. You no know more. Yes. But yeah. that, um, like my mentor was talking about the sick part. Like, I, 
I love this guy because he was there when I had my transformation. Like, you know how Paul had Ananias and the oh, scales yeah. fell off? This man was my Ananias. Mm -hmm. So I quote him a lot and I love him a lot because I needed him at that moment. Right, right, right. So another thing he used to talk about is, like you said, people willfully sinning. Yes. If you're still going to church and you're willfully sinning, like he used to tell us, be honest about it. Because then God can get to the root of the matter. Exactly. Because why are you doing what you're doing? So it's better, matter of fact, I told a friend of mine this earlier this week, if you know you're in sin, it's better to keep going to church right. than not running from God. Oh, yes. Because if you're still going to church, you know you need Jesus. Exactly. But be honest about it. Yes. Whatever that sin is, whether it's you know alcohol, drugs, women, whatever it is you're doing, right. be honest about it, and then you can get to the root of it. Exactly. Because there's something driving you there. Yes. When I used to abuse alcohol, it was bitterness. Because I was angry about a lot of stuff, and I just buried it with alcohol. Mm. It took me years and years to get to the point of freedom. Because what do we do? We tell people stop preach. I mean, excuse me, we preach stop drinking instead mm -hmm. of why you're drinking. Yes. So what I learned how to do in my evangelism times and ministering to people is get to the why. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do me any good to tell you to stop smoking weed if I don't know why you're smoking it. Correct. Why are you smoking it? Mm -hmm. Because. <laughs> This one girl I used to date, well, we didn't date, but we dated. Anyway, her thing with alcohol, excuse, she used to drink a lot and smoke a lot, right? When we got to know each other better, she finally admitted what happened. Now, I wasn't a Christian at the time, but I still remember this night because it was a real, it was a moment. So we were sitting in the room and she was like, yeah, because I asked her about, because she was a vegan too. So the conversation went all the way around. You know, we were drinking and just talking, right? So she said, uh, yeah, I'm a vegan. I was like, you know, what made you become a vegan one day? She was like, yeah, I just don't like meat. Mm. Then we just kept talking, listening to music. And then she had a little tear, right? And I'm like, what's wrong? She was like, well, I became a vegan after my abortion. She had an abortion and they broke something. And she remembers seeing the baby. That's why she can't look at meat. Mm. Which is also why she stayed high and drunk. Right, right, right. Because something happened when she had that abortion. Mm -hmm. Something in her soul broke. Now, that was, like I said, I wasn't at the time, I wasn't a Christian. But now I know why God let me have that moment and I always remember it. Because when we're ministering to people, why? Why are you drinking? Why are you smoking? Yeah. Why, are you, why are you promiscuous? Mm -hmm. Why are you gay or whatever your mm -hmm. crutch is? So mm -hmm. it's the why. Yeah. And mine was bitterness. Mm. So like I told you before, I'm write a book about that thing. Because <laughs> oh, yeah. God took that off me, I, I want to be able to help somebody else. Oh, yes. Yeah, you're right. And I think, too, even with those type of things, dealing with in the church, mm -hmm. a lot of times people sin because it feels good. Because, you know what I'm saying? Anything that's done in secret and yeah. you feel like you're giving it away, the in, or getting away, the enemy gives you more of a of a pleasure, if that makes sense. It's more pleasurable if you think you're getting away, nobody <laughs> sees it, you're doing it in the dark. But the Bible yeah. says, whatever is dark, done in the dark shall be brought to light. Mm -hmm. And the scripture said, the wages of sin is death. And I love that scripture, when it, when Paul referred back to Moses, said, I'd rather enjoy, I'd rather be a, a, door, a doorkeeper in the house of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin just for a season. It's only a season. You know, and just because we're under grace and not under law, according to the sixth chapter of Romans, that doesn't give us a license to sin. Yeah. What should we sin? Yeah. Because we're not under the law, but under grace, God forbid. So, yeah, it's, you know, and it's about having a respect <laughs> and a love for Christ. Yeah. Man, some people don't know. Some don't want to know. Yes. But the scripture, you said the ways of sin is death. Yes. The one that scared me more than that was, I can't remember which book it was, but it said, they store up wrath for themselves. Mm. So I'm like, wait a minute. That means God's keeping score. <laughs> yes, he is. He is. That scares me more than the wages because I earned that. Oh, yes. <laughs> but when you just storing up a wrath, I'm like, okay, that means God going, well, we do it to ourselves. That's right. But God's going to have a worse punishment. Oh, yes. And especially when you know better. That's right. Yes. So yeah. it's, you know, like I said, but I always try to get to the why. Even myself, when I feel myself slipping, I just sit down and be like, why? What's wrong with me? Mm. Why is my mind over here? Mm -hmm. Why is my mind over there? Why am I doing this? You know what I mean? Why am I around these people? Yes. So I try to stay, you know, with Christian brothers and I spend a lot of time at the gym. 
like that helps me kill my stress too. Gotcha. Yeah. But it's um. My friend, let me ask you this: when you when you were wilding and running the streets, and you said you're sitting with the prison and all that, what drove you to that after you had your magical healing? Like, what do you think it was? Honestly, I think it was the enemy that really had peeped into my future what God was going to do. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And he, you know, when I got when I got baptized in Jesus' name, got healed. Yeah. I my everything about me changed far as, you know, me being clean and and people can see the transformation. Yeah. But the scripture also says that wait until you being due with power from on high. That's why my aunt told me, get filled with the Holy Ghost. Because if you don't and you backslide, you, you'll take on many other, more seven more demons. And, and the, the last estate is worse than the beginning. Yeah. That's why when you backslide, it's hard to come back. It's hard to get back to Christ. Because you person. pick up more. And the enemy have you doing more things than what you did. I've already, you know, was trying to come o overcome alcoholism and all these other things. Yeah. But then once I got healed... The enemy is like, no, I got to destroy him. So that's why he had me doing the things that I was doing. Yeah, was was it the lust for power, money? Like, what do you think? What do you think your incentive was? Wanted to be looked at like I'm some somebody. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, being one of the people to look up to me. You want to basically want everybody to, you know what I'm saying? You want to be one of the big. Yeah, boys. I want to be the one with the money. You know, the nice cars yeah. and you know. Oh. Take everybody out shopping. Look, y'all get what you want. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Going to the places, clubs, and buying everybody drinks. All these things. And I'm looking back. That's not even you. I can remember, remember one incident when I'm at a nightclub on a Sunday night. And this is the thing. I thank God, man. Because when I said I should have been dead, I'm not talking about shot. I mean, driving and don't know how you got home. Crazy stuff, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Leaving the club, man, being a yeah. bunch of guys like speeding and just dumb stuff car accidents yeah. you know all type of stuff and it was bad but i can remember one situation i'm in the nightclub and the music is playing and all at once as i'm standing there looking at everybody and it came a thought came to my mind why are you here you why don't supposed you to be here why are you, you know god was dealing with me then i didn't even listen you know what i'm saying or didn't even no. recognize it you ever been in the streets and you had a stranger walk up to you and be like you don't fit yes okay so especially I'm after you, after you ever <laughs> see Christ, you definitely stick out like yeah. a sore thumb. I had people say that. Yeah. They'll, they'll just look through the, like the whole crowd and just pick me out. Yep. Like, yo, who are you? Exactly. Or a woman to walk by. Like, this happened to me once. This had this spot called the Sugar Hill in Hampton. Mm. It was right down the street from Hampton University. I'll never forget this one night. This girl, we was on the dance floor dancing. And then right in the middle of the song, it was one of the Matrix movie moments. Everything froze. And her whole face lit up. She just looked at me and said, you a good boy. Mm -hmm. You a good boy. And that and Master P was big at the time. Remember that song, oh, Bought yeah. About It? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she was like, you ain't no soldier. You ain't no, no you're a good boy. Mm -hmm. You're a good man. You're a good boy. She just kept saying it. And like I said, it was, you know, that Matrix moment. And I'm just looking. Her whole face lit up like that light. Wow. And I'm like, no, I'm a no limit soldier. I'm hard. I'm Wu-Tang forever. Mm -hmm. I'm not a good boy. I'm literally arguing with her. Right. But who's the voice telling me I'm not good? I should have been receiving that. Oh, yes. It was a beautiful woman giving me a compliment. She's calling me good. Mm. That's supposed to lift me up. Right. But I'm being embarrassed by this because mm. my mind was just backwards at the time. Right. Like, You're a right. good boy. You ain't no soldier. That ain't you. You're a good boy. Mm. And I'm just like, yo, what happened? Then, wow. you know, the music came back. Yeah. Everything and went everything back to normal. Go back. And I, I can't remember how long we communicate. I don't know if she walked. I can't remember all that. But I, I was stuck. Wow. And this was before I moved to Atlanta. So this was 1997, 1998 when this happened. Mm. Wow. So God, God, he don't let Dylan, you go. Yeah, he, he loves you. He said, I'm married to the backslide. Married to the backslide. You know what I'm saying? Yo. <laughs> yes. Wow. You got any, um... You got any horror stories that you could share for anybody listening? Mm -hmm. Like you said, you should have been there. You should have been in prison. You got any horror stories you could tell without incriminating anybody? So many. Crazy. Yeah. I would say they're crazy stories. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, just just I, let people know. Don't backslide and play with God. Like don't God. play with God. I'd have been yeah. in situations where I'd have had guns pulled on me. Yeah. I'd have had. I mean, just to keep it real. Dude took a gun, pointed it to my chest, and like I should take your life right now. And my cousin that's passed on, he walks up to the dude and was like, "Yo, man, don't do it. Don't do it. That's my cousin. Don't do it." Then he's then he. Say something, he take the gun and hit me with the gun, the gun goes off. Jumps in the car, stay in my friend's car and take off. So we're, we're sitting there like, it's crazy wow. stuff. But you know, that ain't the dumbest thing. Oh, it gets After worse? that, it gets worse. <laughs> it gets worse. <laughs> and I'm giving God the glory for sparing my yeah, life. Yeah. Enemy don't get no credit. God is good. So ended up, I go, me and my friend, and the next week, we're back with the gun looking for the guy. Just and... The and when we wow. find him and, and and go to approach him, and the next thing you know, um, he runs all this commotion. So the police is coming. We leave and shoot back home. I'm going to go back that next hour or so with with somebody that's riding with me, and literally flipped the car, broke my jaw, and ended up in the hospital the very next day. <laughs> so you can't tell me the enemy won't trying to take me out. That's crazy stuff, man. You roll the car over. Top the tree with it. Hit the ditch, went up in the air, hit the top of the tree. Oh, yeah. You ain't supposed to make, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. When, my cousin yeah. did tell me. I'm scared. That you when he got to me, wow. that my body was hanging out of the car and I wasn't breathing. When he picked me up, I started breathing. Life came back into me. Yeah. Just a lot. So many stories like that, man. God spared my life. That's why I love him so much. God is so amazing. He never gave up on me. And, and you know, that's my ministry now, to tell people God is not only a God of a second chance, yeah. but he's a God of many chances. There ain't nothing that you have done that he won't forgive you for. Yeah, man. Wow. We, you know what? We can stay here forever. I hope and pray you come back. Yes, sir. But let's fast forward to what you just said, restoration ministry. Yes. What is, yeah, explain to us, what is restoration ministry? What is that? To restore, to redeem, to bring back, to win the lost, mm -hmm. those that don't know Christ, those that have fallen by the wayside yeah. and going through a place in their lives where they felt like they have failed God, that they are unworthy to receive forgiveness or redemption. God has given me a ministry through what I've been through yeah. and God restoring me through my situations and my downfalls. And going nine years believing a lie that God would never use me again. Yeah. You know, God has blessed me, man. And just get to to say God has blessed me with a beautiful wife. I have four sons. I have two younger sons. Uh, you know, an eight-year-old and a ten-year-old. Beautiful children. A beautiful wife that's always stuck by my side, always encouraged. When I went through my situation where I gave up on ministry, so I was going to never preach again. I thought that it was too far, yeah. you know, and, and I had failed God. She never gave up. She, never. she went to church and, and kept praying and praying and praying. Next thing you know, God brought me right on back, you know. So that's my ministry now. And basically, I remember about seven months ago, you know, I had, we talked about it. I was in my own church for a minute. I had my own, um, you know, was in George with high school. And then I rented a building from somewhere else. And one of the things that I'm going to say without going into much detail, that I left my covering. I was in my church that yeah. God had put me in and God was using me. So I'm thinking, you know, God is using me now. I can go start my own church. That's Had it. someone that said they're a prophet saying, yeah, God said, you need to go. Went, you know, and and to get permission, you know, not even to get permission, say I'm leaving. And, and, you know, I was told, don't go. Yeah. It's not time. Yeah. I went anyway. Yeah. And when you leave your covering, it, I was so busy pouring out into others, nobody was pouring into me. Yes. So people was getting, I got videos on YouTube that bapti baptizing people in the James River, people getting filled with the Holy Ghost, people getting delivered, set free. All these things are great. God was using me, but I had nobody to pour into me. So once I got drained, it's almost like you can drive and drive, but if you never go to the gas station and refuel, eventually you're going to run out of gas. So I ran out of gas. I had nowhere to go. So next thing you know, I ended up going through a season where I just stopped ministering because the church didn't do what I thought it was going to do. Because all these people can say, why is it that, you know what I'm saying? The church ain't growing. So people that I thought that was with me was against me. 
people I thought that was going to, you know, support the ministry, yeah. tried to pull it down, pull people out of the church and whatnot. So the Lord blessed seven months. Not even before that, a few years before that, God started to use my wife. She was, you know, back in church, praying for me, encouraging me. I'm in a place where I don't, you know, just walking around in guilt. So ended up, she told me, you know, it's you need to get back. God want to use you. Yeah. And um, I literally remember a conversation her and I had where I was telling her, I was walking through my living room. I stopped. I said, you know something? I've learned so much. I said, I'm not the person I used to be to the point because I came up in ministry where, you know, it's all about you're going to hell if you don't do this. You're going to hell if you don't repent. You go no grace. Oh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So a lot of my messages was, you know what I'm saying, repent or go to hell. You're you going know? to hell for wearing jeans. <laughs> you know, like, so <laughs> yeah. I told I said, I've learned so much. Uh, yeah. I said, I don't look at people the same way. Yeah. I said, you know, if God can bring me out of what I'm going through, I know he can do it for anybody. When I said that, all at once my wife broke down in tears. She began to prophesy. She said, the Lord told me to tell you, that's going to be the first message you preach. Mind you, I'm in a state I'm not even reading the scriptures. I'm not praying. I'm I'm so far in guilt. I was like, okay, if you say so, I ain't throwing no more about it. Literally, the very next week, and I'm, I'm going to put this in there too. I remember I felt like I was so far from God yeah. that I literally, in my barbershop, lifted up my hands. I said, Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. I thought God had left me, man. Felt so far away. So my wife, after she told me that, God started dealing with me. I was in bed at night, couldn't sleep, dreaming about death, all type of stuff, people that had passed. I'm like, why am I having these dreams? So ended up, I would have to cut the audio Bible on, the TV with the black screen, and let the, the, the word play yeah. to get sleep. All the same time, God was working on yeah. me, cleaning me, cleansing me. Went to church that very next Sunday, so weak. Felt so far from God. Didn't even go to the altar. Our bishop, he preached, made altar call. I'm sitting there with my head down. And I'm telling you, man, all at once, the Lord, I felt the Lord coming. And he refilled my wife and I both all over again with the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. And I'm telling you, when he refilled me, when when I came through out of the spirit, they were shutting the light off in the church. Everybody had left. I was still in there crying and weeping and praising God. I left there, and I remember I told my bishop, the Lord just refilled me with the Holy Ghost. Ever since then, God has given me such a desire, a hunger, and a thirst. Gifts that I prayed for over 20 years ago, God is doing it right at the barbershop. Winning many souls to the kingdom. Yeah. People getting restored, getting refilled. People that don't know Christ, baptizing people during the weekdays. Oh, I mean, and not me. This is God doing it through me. God getting the glory because I ain't worthy. It's all through his grace and his mercy. So ended up, I'm telling you, man, people that have come to the barbershop that I would have never reached before. Now that saw me in a light that I was in, have given their life to Christ, been baptized. I'm members at our church now. What the enemy meant for bad, God meant it for good. Yeah. People I could have never yeah. reached, now God is reaching. So I said all to say I'm back. You know, I do a broadcast live on Facebook, preach every Wednesday, 8 o'clock. Um, you know, I had, in my past, I had 11 radio broadcasts in seven states. I mean, God was using me in a powerful way. Yeah. But now God is doing more now than what he did in the past. It's like, I'm, I, I know, y'all know you probably heard it before too. But it seems like after you make your biggest mistake, you're broken more. Yes. But then when he puts you back together again, you're like, like twice the prodigal as strong, son. But you're twice as strong. Oh yes. Now I'm not gonna say he wanted you to fall or break, but no matter what happens, you come back stronger. And that's the thing, God has a permissive will, then yeah. he has his divine will. Yeah. Permissive will simply means he'll let you get off track and do your little thing. So you'll admit that leaving early was a mistake? Yes. I shouldn't have. Okay. And I realized that's why now I'm, I'm submitted to leadership. Yeah. God, this is what the Lord told me to do. When he spoke to me these words, win as many souls as you can and bring them to the church. Yeah. Let, the, let the church do their thing and you do what I call you to do. I don't need a title. You don't got to call me pastor. You don't got to call me elder. You don't got to call me minister. Yeah. My name in it is not important. Yeah. His name is important. I don't. Only thing I want to do is, Lord, you've been so good to me. I just want to 
to love you yeah. and win souls to the kingdom. Tell somebody about it. You know what I'm saying? About yeah. he's how God is nothing. If there's anybody out there that's listening to me, yeah. and you may have been in church, you have gotten hurt, somebody have hurt you, you've been betrayed, or you felt like you have just fallen away and God will never use you again, that's a lie from the enemy. God can use you more the second and the third time than he did the first time. It ain't nothing that you have done that God won't forgive you for. He's not only a God of a second chance, but he's a God of many chances. Many chances. He'll reach way down and pick you up. And when he do, things that I went through, man, that I've testified and shared with people that God have blessed and brought them out through my testimony that I went through over 20 years ago and things that I went through now. Yeah. God is awesome, man. Yeah, that heart condition one, that was something else. Oh, yeah. Because you said you came out and felt it instantly. Healed instantly. Yeah, because, well, let me ask you this. After having that kind of a miraculous moment, what would cause a person to go back? If God, you get what I'm trying to say? If yes. God did the ultimate, ultimate right here, why would you turn your back? What are you looking for? You like, know what it is? Going back to when my aunt told me. Yeah. A lot of people, you know, we have people believe different things. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Bible believer. Yeah. And I'm not talking because I read it. I'm talking because I experienced. I've tried religion. I've tried this, that. I've been baptized, titles, and this and that. When I got baptized in Jesus' name and God called me, I got healed. I felt brand new. Yeah. But I didn't wait for the promise of the Father. And without the Holy Spirit, you have nothing to give you power to live above sin. Because you're already in the flesh. How can you fight against an enemy with no power? So people go back because they didn't get they don't, the they, don't have to, they, they truly haven't received the power. Okay. Then after you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, I'm telling you, when I got filled with the Holy Ghost, it's nothing earthly can describe how good it feels. Amen. It's nothing that I have experienced here on earth that I can use as an as a to compare to how amazing it feels when God fills you with his spirit. Man, I'm telling you, you feel love, mm. you feel joy. You feel peace. You feel fire. You know, Jeremiah said it was like fire. Shut up in my bones. I'm telling you, man, you feel so good. You got to tell somebody how good God is and how he feels. So when he filled me with the Holy Ghost, it gave me the second time when God brought me back. Mm -hmm. I was good. Man, I stayed in the Bible for hours, all day and night, reading and studying and, and, and you know, have a love. And God ended up calling me into the ministry. I didn't even know that I was being a minister. Because now you had the power to do it. Yes. Okay, yes. so a miracle without the seal or a miracle yeah, without the power. You, you seal yeah. with the spirit into the day of redemption. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost, not that you won't make mistakes mm -hmm. or, you know what I'm saying, you won't fall short. But when God fills you, he gives you power. The scripture said, and ye shall receive power mm -hmm. after, not before, but after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I tell people, if you've never been filled with the Holy Ghost, <laughs> get it. I'm telling he said in his word, yeah. I give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him for it. You know, you don't got to be in a church. Yeah. You don't got to be in a sanctuary. You don't got to be on your knees. God can fill you with the Holy Ghost right now. Right, wait, All you right. got to do is say, Lord, fill me with your spirit and, and believe it and receive it. It's a gift from the Father. He said, I'll give it to you. And I'm telling you, man, your life will never yeah. be the same. And when you're baptized in Jesus' name, <laughs> all of your sins have been washed away. That's a whole nother. I love the topic of salvation because yeah. I, I got scriptures that I can share yeah. that literally coincides and, 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 and tell you what God's plan is. Yeah, because that, it seems like, you remember the story of the, um, the 10 lepers? Yes, only one. He healed yeah. 10, uh -huh. but only one came back to know the healer. Oh, yes. The other nine left with the miracle. Yep. And yep. we don't know what happened to them. Don't know what happened to them. You know what I'm saying? So, but the other one came back to know the miracle oh. worker. Like, yo, you did this for me. Who are you? Yes. Yes. And only one. For, and he I, was a Samaritan. He wasn't even religion or anything. He was a Samaritan. Yeah. Yeah. So he ended up, um, I can't remember the next verse. But Jesus said, where's the rest of them? Yep. And he was like, well, um, nine. where's Only the other one nine? came back to say thank you. So he got a special blessing. God. Yes. Because I think they said he fell and worshipped, I think. Yep, fell down on the knees and worshipped. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so that's funny. Matter of fact, I think we talked about this last night. So if you just get miracles from God, you just become a better version of your corrupt self. Oh, yes. But you and have to know. You're just serving him for the bread and loaves, serving him for that, which you can get. You know, all the people, when Jesus was feeding the, yeah. um, 5,000, then he fed 4,000, when he was giving the bread and, and the loaves, yeah. you know, and the fishes, and you know what I'm saying? Everybody was fine. But when it got time for him to go to the cross, a lot of them 
that he fed said crucify him. Same Anybody, thing. then when Jesus told him, said, except you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you have no life. All of them went away. And he was right back at the 12. Then he asked Peter in the 12, said, will you also leave? Then Peter said, Lord, where well, should we go? Where am I going? <laughs> Seeing that thou hast word, the words of eternal life. you God. You know, when you've been, going? when you truly have been saved and delivered, you know, it ain't about money. It ain't, That's, you know, it ain't about houses nor land. It's all about Jesus. You know what you just said? As soon as Jesus, okay, he was feeding them, right? Yes. But it, as soon as he put a demand on them, they That's left. That's when the trouble came. Yep. So we, me, eat my flesh. So we want God to give, but we don't want to give we God want, nothing. Yep. Yep. Why? It's selfish, a, a fleshly nature, just to be selfish. But that's God. Yes. What else is there? Exactly. So why is it when God puts a demand on us, we crumble? Yeah. He said, live holy. People say, well, that's too hard. I got to give up too much. No, you don't. I tell people it's better to give up. And the, the gain is so great, eternal. And the blessings on earth. Ain't nothing that Satan has that he can offer us. You know, when Jesus was in the fasting for 40 days and 40 nights and attempted, enemy came to him. How are you going to offer God something he already owns? A lot of people don't know your wealth, your inheritance that God has for us. You have, you, you and I, yeah. believers in Christ, we are more richer than any multi-trillionaire on the earth. Because our Heavenly Father owns everything. It says it's his good pleasures to give us the gifts of, that we desire. Yeah. What do you say? He feed the birds? Yep, exactly. <laughs> what was that? Was that Matthew? Yeah, I believe so. He yep. said, I feed the birds while you worried about food. Yep, yep. Take no I'm, thought for your life. What you should no, eat, what you should drink, what you should put thank on. Thank you. Yep. Take no thought for your life. Yes. But you memorized them. I love the word, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I like I like Psalms and Proverbs a lot. Oh, yes. I got a couple in um, Corinthians I like. Mm. It's... Um, this is something about the book of Psalms. Oh, yeah. I've been stuck there for a while. Yeah, I love it, too. Yeah. I love Psalms 51, David. Yeah, so let me, um, yeah, we're about to wrap up in a few minutes, but yes, let me sir. ask you this. What, um, you own the barbershop now, right? Yes. How was it, was it different being an entrepreneur, having your own thing now? It was, and, and the thing that's so amazing, yeah. my wife, she saw it in me, because when COVID hit, yeah, the barbershop I've been at for almost 18 years, the owner decided to time to close up shop because it was a ministry. All he, he it was a barber shop, but it's also people got delivered there. You said agape? People, yeah, agape. God's unconditional love. Yo, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait a minute. I can't remember this brother's name. Did y'all used to have Bible studies in the yes. back? Yes. Yo, Mr. I got invited I, to that Bible study. I can't remember the other guy. It, it was a, you know, I'm wasting time now. But it was another brother I met. He invited me twice. He said, yo, we'd be having Bible studies at the barbershop. I came, because I was doing mental health at the time. Okay. I think it was 2016, maybe, when this happened. Because I had clients that lived in the area, off Belt Boulevard and Hopkins. Yes. I got invited to that barbershop twice for Bible studies, mm -hmm. but I never made it. Oh, wow. It was So awesome. I could have met you back in 2016. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I didn't mean to cut you off. Of, but, oh, you're good. Yeah, but now, now, now that you said that, I remember, because it sat right here. Right in the corner, right beside the beautiful Because is there America Best Wings next to it or something? Up a couple doors up, yeah. yeah. Then you got Yo. the... Um, man, it's a small world. Yeah. I got invited to that Bible study wow. twice, man. Right at the barbershop. Yeah, but go ahead. I'm sorry. Yep. No, sorry. yeah, so... Um, yeah. Yeah, I was there for 18 years. And okay. when COVID hit, you know, we was... We was um, what was it, about a year or so? COVID? COVID. Everything shut down? Was it over? Yeah, 2020. Yeah, yeah 2020. The whole year 2020. So, you know, the owner, he decided, you know, it's time now. You know, that but good thing, one of the barbers that had been there much longer than I have, he mm -hmm. owns the shop now, which is a blessing. Okay. You know, but anyway, so I had to make a decision. Do I go back or do I step out, you know, and start my own shop? My mm -hmm. wife's like, you need to start your own shop. You you know what I'm saying? And the owner always told oh, me. I'm going to cut you off one more time. Go ahead. That's the third time you got a word from your wife. Yes. And you went up. Yeah. My, my wife, well, I got, <laughs> That's oh, the third I, I can't wait till she see it because I'm going to lift her. Yo. Up. She is awesome. Man, man. yo. Uh, God. Everybody watching, woman. marry the right person. Yes. Men, marry the right woman. Women, marry the right man. This is the third time you said you yes. got a word from your wife and yes. your life got, your yep. life got Every 10 time times she, better. She always saw man. greatness in me when I didn't even see it in myself. Yo. She saw it, man, and she was like, you are an owner. 
You don't need to rent from nobody. I was like, you think so? She said, yes, See, do it. And when your so wife I stepped said, out on faith, man. And when your wife says that, you feel like Superman. Yes. Yep. So ended up, wow. Lord bless. And when we met, you know, at the time, you know, I was single and um, God blessed us. Now, this one I'm going to say quickly. Yeah. Came to Richmond. Yeah. Um, God blessed us. I met my wife at the barbershop. She yeah. was going into beauty supply. Yeah. I asked her, can I do your eyebrows? Mind you, I hadn't been doing eyebrows at all i did the lady before her like a week before and messed her eyebrows up yeah you know, i wanted she didn't get a lawsuit <laughs> you know what i'm saying so i told my wife i said can i do your eyebrows yeah she said i'll let you know she went in the beauty supply came out she said if you mess my eyebrows up we're gonna fight i said okay i, I said i'm gonna do my best i said i hope i don't mess them up i did them yeah did a awesome job ever since then she started coming back then you know we started talking and talking and next thing you know on my birthday my my birthday is february the 6th yeah i took her out on my birthday yep took her out to eat i believe we went to fridays i believe we sat down to eat and talked and laughed yeah. had a ball our third date i told her i was gonna marry her i said you're gonna be my wife <laughs> she looked at me said i need to get away from you I need to get away from you <laughs> he go <going> crazy <laughs> I said, I knew it. Yeah. And and the thing that is about my wife that I love, she's never been married. She don't have no children. She wanted to do everything right. She got saved through my testimony, mm -hmm. witnessing to her while we dating, telling her about the baptism in Jesus' name, Holy Ghost speaking tongue. Came to our church, got baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost coming out the water. Wow. You know, what year awesome. was this? What year was this? 2006? Uh, no, 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 no. That was like 2000 and my goodness 10 maybe somewhere yeah, you came to years later so you came to pull over 2006 though no oh no it was about 2008 2000. 2000. okay cool. somewhere in that okay. area yeah yeah because yeah, we area. talked about it last night yeah. so i, I could have got the numbers yeah. mixed up but man I'm, i gotta say this one more time ladies and gentlemen brother zach <laughs> 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 married the right person oh yeah Every, God yo, i'm gonna say it one more time y'all when you marry the right person and they give you that word from God, you become Superman or Superwoman, and you can't fail. That's right. And see, the thing that I love, yeah. God always, I've had people to tell me, say, man, God's favor is just on your life. Look, like when I make mistakes, God just say, I love you, man. Don't I even love your son. It. You know, get, come on now. You don't have to do that. <laughs> you got it. You know, yeah. so God yeah. is so amazing. And it, I, I, we could we could talk about this forever too, but you ever we could just do a whole bloopers show. Oh yes. About how many times, even when you do fall, you should have fell ten feet, but you got to be like, look, I'm gonna let you fall one foot. Yes. Just to teach you a lesson. Yes. But you could have fell ten feet because yes. you made a big mistake. Yes. God is love. Like we, God is love. Man, yeah. We, he truly loves us unconditionally. The scriptures say that God so loved the world yeah. that He gave His only begotten Son. God is love. And love is kind. Yeah. Love don't judge. You know what I'm saying? Now, it's going to come a time now. You know, God is love, but we all going to have to stand and give an account yeah. for the things that we've done yeah. in our bodies, whether it be good or whether it be bad. God loves everybody. He said, come now, not later. Let us reason together. Yeah. He said, come to me all you that labor. Labor simply means those that are in sin. God has a way out because the scripture said he don't want no man, no woman to perish, but that all would come to repentance now. But I love God, man. I love the mm. Lord Jesus Christ because he's been so good to me. The scripture where it said chastisement, is that Romans 2? I believe so. I have to look at it to make sure. Yeah, he said because God chastises his Whom own he loveth, children. He, yeah. yeah. Whom he loveth, he correct, he chastises. Yeah, I told, I can't remember who I was talking to. I be, You know, we talk about God a lot. It might have been my brother. But I said, you know what? When I do get chastised, like when he does let you bump your head, I said, I'd rather get chastised now. Oh, yes. And pay for it now. Oh, yes. Then on that judgment day, be like, oops. Yeah. Because then it's too late. Yes. So if he chastises me now and says, that was wrong, that was wrong, do this better. Oh, yes. Or this is good, you can do this better or fix that, whatever. I'd rather deal with it now. Yes. So I could repent now, have my conscience clear. So on Judgment Day, I can just say thank you. That's why the scripture says some men's sin go before them. Yeah. And some come after. We want our sins to get right now, get it yeah. right now. You don't want to stand before God and God say, depart from me. 
You know, the Bible says yeah. that many are going to stand before me in that day. He said, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out demons in your name, prophesied, done all these wonderful works mm -hmm. in the church? And God said, I'm going to profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me. That's a scary scripture, the thing you've been doing all this ministry. All this church. And then stand before God because you did it for self-gain, self-wealth, and your heart wasn't right. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I can say this real quick. Because I've been through this. I had I had this moment before in my past. Because I grew up in and out of church too. A lot of people go into church. And everybody check yourselves. A lot of people love this church. And that church leadership. And that pastor. And that system. But they don't know the real Jesus. Right. But they fit into that system. I don't want to call it a cult. I don't want to go there. Because I've been in churches where the pastor was daddy and his wife was mom. Yeah. And everything was about them. Right. You got to ask the pastor what color Kool-Aid to make. Mm -hmm. So, but you're accepted there and you're validated there. So people fall in love with that culture. Right. But you never know the Jesus who made it. Yes. You just, you spend your entire life serving the pastor, the church, and the first lady. Yes. I've seen that before. And it's a dangerous thing because they give you that search for significance we want. Oh, yes. Like when you talking about the streets. Yes. Because I did it too. Mm -hmm. I got tired of being the nerdy church kid. So I yeah. just wanted to be street for a while just to fit in. So I know what that search oh, yeah. significance is. But a lot of people that don't know the Jesus, like you said, on Judgment Day, he don't know you. It's because yes. you spend your entire life pleasing the pastor, the first lady, yeah. the deacon board. You serving people, oh, yeah. but not the real Jesus. Exactly. And a lot of times in that situation, people that's in, a, that's in leadership role, they make themselves, mm -hmm. they put themselves like they're perfect. Like they never sin. No. Mm. We struggle, ministers struggle harder than, than the congregation. The enemy fights us harder. Yeah. And we need the prayers. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I pray for my leaders. I God strengthen them. You know, I fast for them, everything, because I know what they gotta go through on a daily basis. Attacks from the enemy. Man, you know, if I get them and I'd have no position. What they go through. I could have thank you. Y'all, you gotta that's, pray. That's why I love the fact you brag on your wife. Yeah. You, you're the covering, but you have a covering too. Oh yes, and she's you know awesome. what I mean. I don't, I don't want to play with the words, but you're her covering, but she covers you too. Oh yeah, you know what I mean. She encourages. She, she like, I love things. that. You know, she's taking now. She's helped me come up with a lot of great ideas to take my barbershop to a new, new place, a new plateau. You still just things she's implementing. You know, so anyway, I met her, um, built a brand new house from the ground up. Yeah. God bless us. Then recently, we sold that house and moved into another bigger house. You know, and all this is to God. You know what I'm saying? And you still the credit of the Lord. So you still, you know, win. and the barbershop it grew and it's growing. God is supplying all of our needs. You know, have two beautiful children. Yeah. I mean, and it could have been, you know, I could have been destroyed years ago. You still winning. I, 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 I keep hearing that you still winning. Yes. Because like I told you last night, when I met you, I. I thought it was just all good. Right, right. But you had to go through your own stuff. Yeah, I've been stuff. through a lot, a lot. Yeah, a lot. The ups, the downs, the 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 wins, the losses. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, and man. my barbershop now is a ministry. When I'll, you come yeah, there, I was about to ask you that, too. It's a place you're going to hear the word of God yeah. being preached, gospel, worship, yeah. prayer, Bible studies. Um, yeah, this, people come there I see right through the barbershop, man. I'm telling you, man. So you're going to start doing Bible studies like the Agape did? That's something that's possible for the future. Yeah. You know, right now I do um, live every Wednesday at 8 a.m. Okay. You know, go preach a word, prayer, and praise. I do that. and um, But, you know, like, for an example, this is what I do. Let's say someone comes, sit in the chair, get their hair cut. I'm cutting their hair. I'm listening to them. Mm -hmm. See how they're doing, you know. We started getting on the subject of Christ. And, you know, they may not never heard Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. For the remission of sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I'd be like, hey, you got about 15 minutes on you, 10 minutes? You'd be like, sure. i said, come here, let me show you something. Go to the podium, do a 10-minute Bible study to them. With them, many of them straight through that Bible study have come to the church, baptized in Jesus' name, some filled with the Holy Ghost, and they're members. Yeah. Right there, you know, spare the moment. Because that's what God told me to do. Share okay. the gospel. You know what I'm saying? All right, we're going to... Please come back again so we yes, can talk Yes, I would again. love to. Yes, sir. But we're going to end this now. So I want to end with this. Your ministry's restoration. Yes. You admitted your zeal caused you to step out a little bit early. Too early, yes. Okay, so 
in one or two minutes, let everybody know if I'm looking for God and I want to get saved, and you mentioned it earlier, but I don't know how, I'm too bad, I don't, what is that salvation evangelist message in, in two minutes? Like, how do I find God and not fall? The, the, what I would say, and, and through my experience and through, through the scriptures, yeah. just believe the death, burial, and resurrection that Jesus Christ died on the cross. But I, but I don't know. Saying? But I don't know Jesus. Help right. me. Help me. I don't know Jesus. Help me. A lot of people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you know, I let was, the world know. It would have to be presented the gospel. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? For me, if I was to present a gospel to somebody else, yeah, in two minutes. Two minutes, I would tell them straight up. I say, look, I want to, I want to tell you, this is what I've been through. You know, I've been, been where you are. I may have been further away, or whatever it is. I want to let you know that Jesus Christ loves you and he died on the cross for your sins. Love. And he, if, if it was only you, he would have done it. You know, I would, I would share with them first the love of Christ. Then I would love. begin to share it with them that we all was born in sin and shaping in iniquity. Why God sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for our sins. Once I began to let them know the, what sin is, disobedience, the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, how they transgressed. Then by one man's sin entered into the world, which was the first Adam and the second Adam, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you believe on the death, burial, and resurrection. Then you repent, ask God for forgiveness. Lord, I, I'm a sinner. I, I admit I was born in sin. I, I'm in dire need of a savior. So once they come into that revelation and knowledge, that they need a savior, they need to be saved. A lot of people would just say, now you just repeat after me. Confess and believe, now you are saved. Mm -hmm. I don't have no problems with acknowledging, Lord, I, I want you to come into my life, into my heart. Amen. But then the Bible says that he that believeth, in Mark 16 and 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You gotta go to water to get your sins washed away. It's nowhere in the scripture in the book of Acts, you can find one person that did not receive salvation through water baptism and being filled with the Holy Spirit. St. John, third chapter in the fifth verse said, verily, verily, which means truly, truly. I say unto you, Jesus said to Nicodemus, I say unto thee, except a man is born of the water and of the spirit that he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You can't get around that scripture. Amen. So once you share with them the plan of salvation, Immediately, the Bible said they went the same hour and baptized them in the name of Jesus Christ. Then once you get your sins washed away, God said you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost gives you power. The baptism is when you're washing the blood of the Lamb and your sins have been washed away. So I give them all of it. I don't, I'm not going to give you part of it. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to find some water. I've had people in, almost in the wintertime. I ain't had no water to baptize them. I took them in the James River in the cold water. Baptize them in Jesus' name. Came out of the water. Some came out. I've seen people come out of the water speaking in tongues. God done filled them with the Spirit. So then they got to be taught how to live holy. And I'm going to say this and I'm done. Yeah. Being born again. When a child is born naturally into this world, they're not walking and talking. Nope. You got to what? Teach them. Teach them. You got to feed them the milk. Disciple them. Disciple them. So find you a Bible-believing church that's going to yeah. preach to you the whole counsel of God. Teach them the word. Then they're going to make mistakes. That's all right. Get up. Keep going forward. You're growing into maturity. Then you'll become a full-grown man of God, a woman of God. Then you, mm -hmm. you're ready for the kingdom to be used by Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to end with that. Love, Jesus, cross, repentance, believe, baptism, restoration. And we got it from Brother Paul. He lived it. He experienced it. He knows what it's like to go left and right. God restored him several times. I've been restored several times too, but tonight he told his story. And if you want Jesus, this is how you do it. You understand the cross, repent, believe, faith, and then get discipled. Yes. And barbershop. Yes. 40, 74, 43, Melothian Turnpike. Melothian Turnpike. Right beside for more sales. Um, I'm on the app called The Cut. No average cuts with a Z. C-U-T-Z. You can book all your appointments from there and just come, you know, you need prayer, whatever. Yeah. You know, it's a ministry and that's yeah. what it's there for. And let them know where to find you. TikTok, I'm Instagram. I'm on TikTok under the Evangelist Paul. 
Um, I believe Paul. it's under that. And um, Facebook, Paul Holman. You can look me up on Facebook. You know, Google yeah. No Average Cuts Barbershop. You can pull me up. Hey man, and yes. there's so much more we can talk about, but right. we're going to get to that. Yes. Restoration, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus loves you. God bless you. Peace. Thank you.